Amen. We're going to preach the most obvious and self-explanatory sermon, and it's entitled, Boys and Girls Are Different. Boys and Girls Are Different. Obviously, right? Obviously. But in these days, in this gender-bending, LGBTQ, XYZ, ABCD, STD, HIV, AIDS, society that we live in, that's not so common of a statement. Boys and girls are different. <clears throat> the world needs this reaffirmed. The world needs to hear that, yes, there is a difference between a man and there is a difference between a woman. There is a difference between the child version of both of those. Boys and girls are different. They're different in their parts. They're different in their personalities. They're different in their purpose. And they're different in their performance. The difference in parts is explained right here in this first bit of the chapter that we just read. Genesis chapter 2. And in verse 7 the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So we see here that man was formed of the dust of the earth. Man was formed of the dust of the earth. And he was first formed, and he was first created, as 1 Timothy chapter 2 reaffirms. For man was first created, then the woman. The woman was formed afterwards, the Bible says, look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Look down at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and clothed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Man formed of the dust of the earth. Woman here now formed of the man, of actually a part of the man. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, he says, there is a help meet needed. There is a part of man that is missing and help for him. And then he culminates that by showing him, yes, all of these animals. And Adam says, what in the world am I going to do with these besides name them? But then finally he sees the woman and says, wow, this is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. This is a part of me. And it was completed as one flesh. The finalization, the accumulation of the whole picture here, of the whole event, of the whole story, history of mankind is that they became one flesh there in verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So we look and we see that for a short while there, even for a moment of time, there was something taken out of man and the woman was formed of it. So right from this event, right from the very beginning, not only in their creation being from the dust and from the rib, but we have even in the difference of their parts here outlined and highlighted that for a moment there was a part that was different. Adam was missing a rib and the woman had the rib. So there was a difference in the parts. Now, we can complete this story, but we don't need to get too graphic, but we know that the flesh carries the same type of differences. Now, biologically speaking, when a doctor proclaims, it's a boy, or when he proclaims, it's a girl, he's not just some ex cathedra Pope sitting on his chair just making stuff up and declaring it as if it was truth. No, he's actually making a visual cue. He's making a visual assessment of the child that was born. And based on the parts, he's declaring boy or girl. Get me the, the pink outfit or get me the blue outfit. Whatever it is. There's no judgment here other than it's got the part or it has a different part. Boys and girls are different people. Even in industry, we know that there is often talk of a male end and a female end of a part. A male end and a female 
end of a connection, a male end and a female end of a joint, and they are distinguished by how the one receives the other. The parts are differently shaped, and therefore they go together perfectly according to nature. We take that from industry, we take that from physical facts, and we apply it as a simple understanding that everyone in the world has agreed upon and understood for thousands upon thousands of years, and yet suddenly we're confused about the fact that boys and girls are different. Boys and girls are different. More physical difference. Go to Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Song of Solomon. After Proverbs, there in the middle of your Bible, you have Ecclesiastes, and then you have Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. More physical differences between man and woman are highlighted. We have here, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, and verse 1, a man here describing a lady. He's describing her as beautiful, as fair. And in this great descriptive imagery, he portrays what he sees when he looks upon the woman. Look at a Song of Solomon, chapter 4, and verse 1. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like the flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like the place of a, a like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like a tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. The man here describes with that great imagery, the beauty, the eloquence, the, the, the desire that he sees when he looks upon, yes, the eyes of his love, the hair of his love, her teeth, the lips, the temples, the neck, and the two breasts. He describes clearly what he sees when he looks upon her. And the difference is there highlighted is thy, thy two breasts that he beholds. Beauty, even in the man, is found by the description that the lady makes. And this reveals that, yes, even a man has a physical um, characteristic. Something that the woman would look upon and desire based on her sight. Psalm of Solomon, chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly said, his cheeks are as a bed of spices and sweet flowers, his lips like lilies dropping sweet smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with barrel, his belly as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. And the woman here even describes the man in the same type of light. He des she describes him as having these great physical appearances. Uh, one that stands out here is legs like pillars of marble. A, a ruddy countenance, something that's a little bit more rough. Um, so from her perspective, yes, we see this description. And also, the man again turns it back upon her. And in chapter 7 and verse 2, he says, Thy navel is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set upon, set about with lilies. I don't know, ladies. How do you feel about being told your navel is a round goblet and belly like a heap of wheat? 
I think it was a different time then. But still the description is made there, and you find more and more them just describing one another with clear physical differences. What catches the eye? What brings the desire between the man and the woman? And we need to look at these differences. And the ones that are highlighted there quickly are, are the breasts upon the woman, or maybe the, the strong legs that are pillars. I think we see that the, the woman is more easily identifiable by an outward beauty. I find that the woman perhaps is grasping at straws to try to find something nice to say about her husband. But, but there's, a, there's a clear difference there. Very, very eloquently placed within the Word of God so that we can understand that there are things on men that women like. There are things on women that men like. And, and God wired us this way. Men aren't always so outspoken about these things. Men aren't always so um, quick to describe the woman and how beautiful she is. And to a fault, men, we need to do that more and more, I believe. But you still see within this picture, within this address, within this relationship between the man and the woman in Song of Solomon, that they, they had things that they liked about them. And it was unique to the gender. It was unique to the, the sex. It was unique to the man. It was unique to the woman. And the opposite saw those things and was able to express them. Now, too often the women, since they don't receive of the compliments, they don't receive of the men telling them that their belly button's like a big goblet. They don't hear all those compliments all the time. They, they tend to turn to things like the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the bonnets and the ornaments of legs, the headbands, the tablets, and the earrings, the rings, the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles, and the wimples, and the crisping pins, the glasses, and the fine linen, and the hoods, and the veils. But I'm here to tell you, women, you don't need to do so. The women are beautiful just the way they are. And as you read through Song of Solomon, you don't find him describing her as having such excellent tinkling symbols about her or such wonderful chains and bracelets. I love that nose ring on your face. And yet today, that's the thing that, that men and women often look at in order to find their attraction. They're looking for the brand name. They're looking for the jewelry. They're looking for the outward apparel. They're looking for something that fadeth away, something that perisheth. And those things shall be destroyed along with the world. That, that fall of those things, and, those, and they'll just be swept away. We need to have a different type of desire upon a man and upon a woman, depending on who we're talking about. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible describes... Yes, we already saw that there is a desirous thing that a man sees upon a woman. And they are all typified, they're all described based on wonderful things in God's creation that they would see. Or wonderful marvels that man would make. You know, the woman was described as having, having a neck like a, a battlement that David had made. It was strong, it was tall. And that was something that, that Solomon loved to see upon the woman when he looked upon her. Upon his wife when he looked upon her. But we also see that not only just the physical, not only just the outward beauty, that the conversation of the wives is something of great value. 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible reads in verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair, of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. God looks upon the meek and quiet spirit and he sees a great price. He doesn't look on the bling. He doesn't look on the jewels. He doesn't look on the ornaments, the clothing, the changeable raiment. He doesn't look at all the things that the world looks upon. God looks upon the spirit and sees beauty in a woman. Her adorning... Don't let it be that outward adorning, plating of the hair, wearing of gold, putting on makeup. Let it be that hidden man. Let your beauty be something that is to behold within. Boys and girls are different. And girls are, are more likely, I believe, girls are more um, tend to put on more of the outward to do a show. To put on the outward in order to attract. To put on the outward adorning in order to bring in the compliments, bring in the desire, bring in... But, hey, a godly woman is a great price. And a godly man will see that. And so those of us who are not married, look for that godly woman. 
Look for that godly man. Look for the hidden man of the heart. Look for things that are beautiful in them and on them that aren't quantified by things of this world. And if you are married, hey, look upon your wife for those good attributes. Look upon your wife for those things that you see that are of great beauty and compliment her. And the ladies the same. Build up your husbands. Strengthen them as you encourage them to continue to live that meek and quiet spiritual life, which is in the sight of God of great price. We're continuing on. We see boys and girls are different in their physical appearance. Boys and girls are different in their parts. And too often our tendency is to think that our parts aren't uh, good enough. Our parts aren't proper. Our parts aren't a certain way. Maybe, maybe there's a higher expectation that we've seen from the media of what our parts should represent, what they should be covered with. But our parts are God-given. And our parts are the beauty that makes us up. And we ought to embrace those. We ought to be encouraged that, hey, man, you have man parts that should be highlighted and those that shouldn't be. Women, you have women parts that should be highlighted and those that shouldn't be. We ought to live quietly. We ought to be meek and have the right spirit before God and not make it all about showing off our parts, if you understand the next thing that boys and girls are different about is personalities. Boys and girls are different. People are personalities. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. 1 Peter, you're still there? For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So again, we see that quiet and meek spirit upon the ladies. We find those ladies in subjection unto their husbands, as it says in, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. Likewise, you wives be in subjection unto your own husbands. And that's a personality trait that I believe is indicative of the woman. Women are, are generally, or at least they should be taught to be of a meek and quiet spirit. If it's the opposite, if, if it's something that is loud and it's someone that is stubborn, we are now in the, in the territory of the strange woman. Well, what's the problem here? It's because the world has had influence. If you've ever seen um, little, little girls playing and little boys playing, Generally, the young, the young girls, the little toddlers, they're meeker and quieter in their, in their character. They tend to play softer. They tend to like the dainty things. They tend to be a little bit more fragile. If someone bumps them, they'll shed a tear. Whereas boys are just rough and tumble just by nature. They're going to knock stuff over. They're going to try to knock stuff over. They're going to be rough. They're going to be tumble. They're going to be the one that takes that delicate little girl who's playing with a flower and a Barbie, and they're just going to rip its head off, right? <laughs> they don't care. Boys and girls are different. And so that personality of little girls, I believe that ought to grow up with them. They ought to have that meek and gentle and quiet and even tempered spirit. And I believe God puts that in them and that's their natural state. When we have the loud and stubborn rebellious woman. That's the strange woman of Proverbs chapter 7. That's the woman of the world. That's the woman that's been taught. It's her responsibility to puff her chest out and get a job. It's her responsibility to mind her house, to be her own woman, to be strong, to be fearless, to and her feet abide not in her house. So she wouldn't even look to lead about her house. She is strange. She's unusual. She's different. But young ladies, soft, delicate, leadable, teachable, and yet strong in the things of God. They're not afraid with any amazement. They're not turned about when their husband says something like, hey, I know our family's here. I know your family's here. I know our whole life is here. We're going into Canaan. God told me to go. We're going. And Sarah, the type here, Sarah, the picture here, obeyed him, calling him Lord. She was not afraid with any amazement. She didn't fear because her heart safely trusted in her husband, her Lord. She was trusting in God to lead about her husband. She's not afraid of any amazement. She's not worried. And so she can live in that comfortable position where she is soft. She is delicate. She is easily teachable. She is easily 
leadable. She is just willing to follow her leader. She is willing to follow her husband, and nothing's going to shake her from that. She's not going to be afraid. She's not going to doubt. See, the, the problem with the strange woman, the problem with the women of this world, the problem with, with, with the pantsuit-wearing, uh, short-haircut ladies is, is the fact that they're just, they're just scared. They're scared to relinquish any self-control. And praise the Lord, my wife never you know, got a buzz cut and was a pantsuit wearer. But she had great fears of putting trust into her husband. When she recently got saved, she had to have control over different compartments of her life. And even as she grew in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, she was able to give those compartments off to me. Give one by one by one by one and 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 relinquish that control and the only way you relinquish that control is by not being afraid with any amazement we like to control things because that way our fears are before us we're not we're not letting go we're not letting ourselves be vulnerable we're not giving ourselves the option to be hurt and women today that's exactly what they do when they go out and they 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 get the job and they have to work through life they're afraid that if they if they let go of the job, if they let go of the career, if they let go of the purpose, if they let go of the financial control, if they let go of the leadership within the house, they're afraid that they're going to be hurt. They're afraid that they're going to suffer. They're afraid that losing control in the long run is going to be detrimental to them. But God promises that that's not so. Look at Sarah called Abraham Lord, she was able to submit to the fullest where, hey, whatever you say to do, boss, whatever you say to do, master, husband, whatever you say to do, I'm not going to be afraid with any amazement because I trust the Lord that's leading my husband. And therefore, these women who are, yes, by nature, young girls, little girls who are meek and quiet and gentle and soft and delicate little flowers, they can grow up that way if they're nourished that way. Because don't think I'm picking on the ladies here. The problem is not necessarily the ladies at all points. The problem is that there's no men to lead them about. Of course they're going to be afraid with amazement. Of course they're going to try to hold everything close to them because they've been hurt, they've been burned, they've been, they've been destroyed, they've been, they've been let down by men. It starts in the home. Their home, their first home, it starts with daddy. It starts with daddy not being the strong leader. It starts with daddy not being the husband to the little girl's uh, mom. It starts with daddy not providing. It starts with daddy letting the little girl down. And that will carry on. And suddenly that meek and quiet and gentle little flower of a daughter, of a little girl, who is just so innocent at one point, starts to make those compartments. She starts to take those things whereby she's not going to get burned again. She's not going to allow that area of her life to be vulnerable. She's not going to trust daddy to show up to the recital. She's not going to trust that uh, someone means something when they say it. She starts to compartmentalize, take control to the point where eventually she's her own woman. She's not going to trust anyone for anything. She's going to lead about her destiny. The problem so often is the men. Men... Like I said, ladies tend to have that meek and quiet spirit when they're little. Men tend to be loud and boisterous and stubborn, just like you would see upon the strange woman, because she's adopted manly character traits at the cost of being a feminist. You know what I mean? She acts more like a man when she's trying to be feminist. But men, that loud and boisterous and stubborn hard-headedness, that actually leads to them, lends to good leadership in certain situations. Some of those characteristic traits, and uh, <clears throat> it's one lesson that uh, my wife and I have learned from a mom that had many, many children, including twin boys and a couple other, um, sh that we need to recognize when men, or when little toddlers, when little boys, are being rebellious, and when they're just being boys. There's a difference, because a boy acting out his, you know, mojo, acting out his strength, acting out his, his leadership, pushing kids around. Sometimes that's just boys being boys and we need to let them be boys. Obviously drawing lines. When, when, when a, little, a little boy sometimes questions his mom, and I think my, my wife is still learning about this, he's not necessarily just doing it out of being rebellion, he's doing it out of the desire in his heart to be the loud, boisterous, strong leader that he will one day grow to be. But remember, boys and girls are different. Girls are naturally in that delicate flower, lead me about, uh, you know, holding on to daddy's leg, carry me, soft um, um, suppleness, 
Um, and they grow up and they ought to stay that way so that they're provided for and cared for by the strong men that are ripping the heads off their barberies and just kind of doing all sorts of crazy things to the woman, you know, like, like in the picture of Abraham, just, just going, honey, I talked to God last night, we're going to Canaan. I mean, that, that seems reckless in the eyes of a woman who's generally more, but no, <clears throat> the, the difference is that, that they have different personalities, they have different characteristics about them, and we need to nourish those things up. Why? Because those characteristics, whether it be the soft and delicate, gentle lady, young lady, or whether it be the rambunctious, uh, strong, pig-headed little boy, right? We need to nourish those things up and put them in the right place so that when they are grown, they're able to fall into their respective categories. The young ladies, they grow up, they're led by dad, they follow dad. Dad eventually, you know, sees something in, in the young man that his daughter sees something in and marries them off. These two shall be one flesh. They cleave unto father and mother until they go. The, the, the boy, he grows up and he's strong and he kicks back to mom, but he's, he's obedient to his dad. He's learning from a strong dad who led his out. He grows up. He sees a young, a young lady and, you know, he goes and he throws her up on his shoulder and, and carries her away from the husband who gave him up, right? <laughs> We're supposed to notice, yes, those differences, those personality traits, those differences in the two. Those things that you don't have to even teach young children to do, to be a boy and to be a girl. I mean, it's just natural. Caleb's like, stinky pinky, and he kicks the air whenever he sees the pink part of the uh, toy store. It makes him angry, right? We didn't train that into him. I mean, he likes trucks, and he likes cars, and he likes loud stuff. We didn't, we didn't sit him down and say, now, Caleb, you have to like things the boys like, right? Um, it, it was, there was a point in his life where he, he liked the dollies. He noticed that there was one that like, didn't have clothes on. And I believe his fathers should be fathers, and we should be able to be soft and, and know how to hold a child. I mean, that's just, that's just a given, right? So there was a time when he would play with the dolls and have his mommy come help put um, clothes on it or what have you. But I mean, two weeks later, we're like, hey, look, there's that doll again. He's like, yeah, and he just like punts it across the room or something. Like it just, just like that. Like I'm done being soft for this thing. Like let me break it, right? The boys, they're boys, and then girls, they're girls. Because because as soon as he did that to his little friend's dolly, she's just crying. Ah, oh, it's the worst thing ever. And Caleb hurt my dolly, right? Right? It's just it's just nature. It's just natural. Boys and girls are different. They're different in their parts. They're different in their personalities. They're different in their purpose. Like I said, men are to be leaders. Men are, are naturally leaders. Little boys naturally push back against mom. They, they, do, it be, they do it because it's, it's unnatural for them to be led about by, by a lady. I, I mean, it's just, it's just natural that he would want to have dominion over it. So the mom's responsibility is to kind of nourish up the good, nourish up the bad, while still exhorting that, hey, I'm the boss, and still putting that into the child, with correction and rebuke and all those sorts of things. But men are leaders. In Ezekiel chapter 3, when Ezekiel was called, God said that I am going to make thy forehead as an adamant harder than flint. He is going to give him a hard head. He is going to give him just a stony forehead. And why was this? People might be like, what a stubborn, pig-headed, just brute of a man. He won't listen to anything. Well, God made him that way. Why? Because he was leading hard-headed, rebellious, stubborn, no good Israelites back to God, and they were constantly rejecting him. So he needed to be firm. He needed to be hard. He needed to be hard-headed, he needed to have a flinty forehead so that he could lead. Men's purpose is that they would be leaders. Men's purpose is also that they would be dads. The Bible says, husbands, love thy wives. There's that softness, the love, the care, the genuine compassion that a husband ought to have for his wives. The Bible also says, dads, provoke not your sons to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's to be a softness, a gentleness among the man that, yes, when they're leaders, they're hard-headed, they're, they're strong, they're stubborn, they're not going to change for anything. But when they're dads, they're loving their wives. They're caring for their children, bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The next thing men are to be is, yes, leaders, yes, dads, but they're also supposed to be providers. Their purpose is to be providers. Food and raiment. Yes, God promised he would supply those things, but he does it by the vehicle of the hard-working man in the ideal situation. The man that goes out 
and seeks sustenance. The man that goes out and works tirelessly. The man that goes out and doesn't complain when he works overtime. Two jobs to provide. Men are leaders. They're to be dads. They're to be providers. Genesis set up the sweat of thy brow. The whole purpose that God made man was there was not man to till the ground. He made men to work. He made men to have that purpose. Be a leader. Be a dad. Be a provider. It's the purpose for a man. Turn to Titus chapter 2 and verse 2. Titus 2. <clears throat> this continues. Titus 2 and verse 2. It says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. So the, we know the Bible says that if any provide not for his own, especially though of his own house, he is worse than an infidel. Here the Bible describes the aged man. Now they're sober, they're grave, they're temperate, they're sound in faith and charity and patience. They're to carry that forward. That's supposed to be something that becomes a mark for them as they grow older. And the same thing, like I said, when you have a child and you raise them up, you're to raise them in the same way that when they are old, they shall not depart from that faith that was taught them. They are to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. And that comes from a man with a purpose, being a leader, being a dad, being a provider, and not just doing it today, not just doing it the next day, doing it day after day after day after day. That aged man growing in grace, that aged man growing in patience and charity. He is sober, he's grave, he's temperate. Now he's gonna shake him. He's not hot and cold, but he is sound. Men are leaders, men are dads, men are providers, men are that rock in the household. And likewise, the ladies, if you read down, it says the age women likewise. There will be those things as well, but they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. There is a teachable spirit that is required here because, yes, the woman, she's aged. She's grown. She's got behavior that is as holiness. She's not a false accuser. She's not given a much wine. She is a teacher of good things. But there, if there is not another generation coming up to be taught of those good things, the whole thing falls apart. And this is why children ought to be begotten. Children ought to be begotten. Children ought to be begotten. And as those young girls, yes, they do naturally, I believe, have that meek, quiet spirit. A key point of them must be that they are teachable. They need to be taught to be sober. They need to be taught to love their husbands. They need to be taught to love their children. So much more today. These things are not taught to any of the young girls. They're to be taught to be um, discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The world of women, the world of young girls is being taught the opposite. The word of God is being blasphemed. They need to hear this biblical truth that, hey, boys and girls are different. Boys and girls have different parts. Boys and girls have different personalities. Boys and girls have a different purpose. Men lead. Men are dads. Men are providers, women, and help meet for him. A suitable help, a desirable help, something that is needful for the man who is all those things. And as the woman is that helper, she's doing all the same things. She's exhibiting all of the same behaviors. Because it says the aged women likewise, they got to be sober, grave, tempered, all those things that their husband is setting forth in his leadership as an example but she's also teaching the young ones the same things. She's growing that next generation in the same actions, in the same characteristics. Boys and girls are different in performance. The Bible says there in Titus verse two, chapter 2 and verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So the performance of these things, the performance of, yes, the different parts, the, you know, even the genetics just shows you they're different. They're, uh, they're different, boys and girls, in their personalities. They're different in their purpose. The performance of these things is where everyone thrives. Discreet, chase, keepers at home. This is where a woman thrives. This is where a woman performs best. God doesn't give commands that aren't good for you. God doesn't give 
ordinances that aren't good for you. Everything that God desires for your life is good for you in the end. And the God-given role for the wives, for the young girls when they grow up, is that they would learn, they would be taught to be discreet, to be chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. This is the best position. This is where a woman thrives and grows. Second John chapter 4, and if you would, you can turn to Proverbs 31. Turn to Proverbs 31. In 2 John, the Apostle John is writing to the writing unto the elect lady and her children. And he says in verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. So the command came from the Father that the children would be taught all of the things of God. And now the Apostle John is looking to the elect lady, seeing the children rejoicing greatly that the children are found, yes, walking in the truth, found and receiving the commandment from the Father. And how much more does the young woman, the, the mother, how much more does she rejoice to see those things, to see her young children and to hear it? I mean, moms, they just love that when someone's like, man, your, your child is so well behaved. Man, your child is walking in the truth. It just makes a lady's heart Warm. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. And I'll get there. Proverbs 31. Now we see in Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, so worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her husband, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it, and the fruit of her hands. She, and with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth. Not out by night. She layeth her hand to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand unto the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands unto the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sitteth among the elders of the land, she maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles to the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is a law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, needeth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. We already saw the husband is praised in the gates. They know who this woman is belongs to. And we see a great diligence in her, the virtuous woman. She is constantly working. So that, that illusion, that, that, that lie, that, that false thing that, that says that, that a woman that is, is not in the workforce is just lazy or not doing anything or not busy enough. She needs to get proactive. This woman looks busier than they all. This woman looks busier than even can be comprehended as she's buying fields and selling them. And as she's, she's finding ways to make money without having to submit unto another authority. She's praised in the gates, the Bible says. If you look in verse 29, it says, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands. Let her own works praise her in the gates. She doesn't need to praise herself. She doesn't need to build herself up and show that herself is some great thing. Everyone looks at her and knows of her praise. Everyone looks at her and knows of her position. Everyone looks at her and knows that she is nothing more than a help me for her husband. Nothing more than fulfilling the perfect will of God for her life. Now look, in verse 28, her children... Rise up and call her blessed. Wow, that warms a mother's heart to have her children. Mom, you're blessed. Mom, we love you. Mom, you're the best. Mom, you, you, have, you have so much going for you. Her husband also here, he praiseth her. And husbands ought to do more than, more than this even. Praise her. Give her gifts. Show her that she is 
love. Show her that she is appreciated. I mean, this husband, his wife is so diligent, his wife is so virtuous, that even he is praising the gate for the works that she is doing. The performance is this. Though there will be scorn, what happens when you're blessed of God? Though the world may look at you and be like, oh, you're just a stay-at-home mom. What do you do all day? You just sit around and you're in diaper, you're, you know, up your elbow in diapers and all that. Hey, there may be scorn, there may be attack from the world, but the praise of that woman's husband, the praise and the blessing of her children and the praise of those that recognize a virtuous woman will put to silence all of the accusations, will put to silence all of the scorning. This is the bonus. This is what the woman receives above and beyond as she performs her different task, as she performs what God wants for her, is that she is indeed praised. So ladies, cutting your hair short and buying a pair of pants and a suit will not get you praised. If anything, it'll make you miserable. I don't know how many times I've seen women um, who just are miserable because they're out in the workforce. Uh, my wife, again, would testify of that, that, that she at one point was strong and in the workforce and trying to do it. And she entered the man's work of um, an auto factory, and it sucked the life out of her and ruined her. It nearly killed her. And when her doctor said, you need to get out of the workforce, you need to become a mom, you need to have a simpler life where your only responsibility is a young child, she almost mocked it at the time, saying, I could never afford it. I could never do I could never... And, 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 and now here she is, and she will tell you that, hey, that's the right path. That's the good and right way is to be within the will of the Lord, performing his will as he works in her and does what she is required to do. Boys and girls are different. The men here, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the ladies, care for your home, care for your children, care for your husband. Do everything you can do by faith to be what God wants you to be, trusting Him to lead you through it. The men are different. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Look at this. 9 and verse 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun. All the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor, which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where thou goest. So here, there's a grave ending for the man. There's a grave where the man is going. And in this life, though all these things be vanity and they will fade away as a dust, Hey, look, it seems to be that the Bible is encouraging us here. The Lord is encouraging us, men, that whatever our hand findeth to do, just do it with your might. Whatever opportunity comes before you, do it with your might. Look, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. So to me, that is saying, hey, with your might, do work. With your might, find device. With your might, obtain knowledge. With your might, grow in wisdom. You're supposed to live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of this vanity. So what's the, what's the job? What's the performance of a man? Is that a man would be joyful in his labors. Yeah, it's tough when you're out there working with your might, with the strength of your hand. Especially when you look beside you and people just aren't working as diligently or as hard as you. You start to feel like you're the only person who actually gives a rip about the job that you're doing. But hey, God will bless you in this. So your job as a man is to find something for your hand to do. Do it with your might. Whether it's your work, whether it's device, or maybe that's invention, maybe that's being creative. Whether it's just by growing in knowledge, whether it's wisdom obtaining that can help and strengthen others. Man, you're to do it with your might. And the, the contrary, not even the contrary, just the overarching, all of that while you are laboring, the all-encompassing purpose of your life here, though it is vain, is to live joyfully with the wife that is caring for you, that is you know, being a, being a praise in the gates. That is performing her duty as a chaste keeper at home. She is thriving in that, and you are thriving and living joyfully with that. But the Bible here even says that, that um, it says, you know, let, let, your, let your clothes be white. I can't see it now. 
That would be the woman's responsibility, though, because as we can see, I stained my shirt today. The lady is to be the help me. The lady is to be the one that keeps the man's clothes weak. While he's out there performing whatever his hand findeth to do, doing it with all his might, even going beyond strength upon strength until there's nothing left in him, working, devising, gaining knowledge, growing in wisdom, getting dirty in the process, right? He has a wife to return to, to live joyfully with. And that's his part in this vain life. That's his part in this journey, in this labor which he takes under the sun. The whole world, the whole life that we're now living is described here, men, as labor. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. And we're to do that with our might, man. We're to go out, go the extra mile, toil, work, device, knowledge, gain, grow in knowledge. And, and gain in wisdom and grow in that. And as you do that, hey, live joyfully with your wife. Enjoy your family. Love your children. Nurture up your children to be the same. That's your lot, man. That's the performance of all the things we've talked about. Boys and girls are different, people. Boys and girls have different parts. Boys and girls have different personalities. Boys and girls have a different purpose in life. And the performance of that is fulfilled when all of these things are realized and embrace the performance of the lady to thrive at her position as the help me the performance of the man to be joyful in his labors and rejoice in the wife all the days of this vanity this is the perfect togetherness and that is when it is best is when it's together it is not good our text said it is not good that the man should be alone Boys and girls are different, but they are best when they are together. It is not good. The Bible says that these two shall be one flesh. These two shall be one flesh under God. And what is the purpose of that? Look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127. One more place. Psalm 127. The performance of the woman in her womanly duties and the performance of the man in his manly duties are best when they are put together in God's perfect matrimony. Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord build the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. So our labor is vain unless it's in the Lord, unless God is giving the increase. Our labor, men, is vain. Our labor, ladies, is in vain, except the Lord is building it, except the Lord is performing that will in you and doing of his own good pleasure through you. Amen. Lo, verse 3, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The end of the realization that boys and girls are different. Yes, they're different in their parts. They're different in their personalities. They're different in their per, uh, purpose and their performance of that. The end of that is that they would come together under God and give the heritage back unto him. That fruit of the room reckoned as a reward. The purpose is to produce children that are the next generation of men and women, boys and girls that are different. They will produce these children that are differently. And these godly children, these children that are led by the Lord, led by their families, led by their moms at home and their dads at work, growing up to be uh, soft, delicate young ladies and, and uh, strong leaders of young men. These men that... These children that grow up and they become boys and they become young adults and they become men and women, they will grow up and what will they do? The same thing, they'll produce godly children that will be young and they'll grow and they'll learn and they'll be taught and they'll grow until eventually they'll produce godly children. They'll produce godly children, produce godly children. The heritage of the Lord grows when we're all in the realization and full understanding that boys and girls are different and they have different purposes and God has different plans for their life. When we embrace that, when we get wired the way we're supposed to and just do what God wants for us, the end is that more children will be born that do the same and more children will be born that do the same. And this is God's way that the world ought to be 
multiplied. The all, will all to be fulfilled. And we need to get on board with God's plan. Hey, the world's going nuts with that, that gender-bending nonsense and, and them talking about changing like kids at a, a young age and letting them letting their parents mutilate them and all this, this garbage. You see it, you see it in, the, in the kindergarten. You see it in the middle school. The world is just programming the whole world against what the Bible is clearly teaching here. Hey, boys and girls are different. We need to embrace that. We need to understand Amen. that, hey, boys, it's good to be like boys. It's good to act like boys. It's good to grow up and want to be men. Hey, women, it's good to be girls. It's great to be young girls. It's great to grow up and want to be a godly woman. Why? So that you could, as a woman, meet a godly husband and make more babies. And so that men could grow up and meet a godly wife and make more babies. Everyone fulfilling their proper role, which is God's way and not the way of the world. world of the world way of the world will lead to destruction, misery, uh, just just wickedness upon wickedness, begotting of itself in its own vile cesspool of disgusting filth. Amen. But God's way is always right. Amen. And I'm in with God's way. Let's all declare that we do that together.